Hey there friends, Dave Pilates, k Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. And this is a missing person segment. But we have so many different moving parts to this channel right now that i got to explain it to you. 475 different videos I've done right here on this channel. You can watch me for months. Probably the highlight that most people would say is the 20 different segments, almost all an hour long, I did about Bigfoot. And we culminated the Bigfoot segments with a final. Pass the final, get the patch. The final has 50 questions. Complete it, mail it out, send it in, follow the instructions on the final page and get the patch. Well, it's not that hard, but if you haven't watched the <laughs> Bigfoot 101 classes, you may not pass. Now along those lines, somebody just recently sent these into me. They're very thoughtful. I appreciated that. Little squiggly, ooey gooey Yeti and Bigfoot. And uh, they said, hey, pass them on to Steve too. So thanks. People always send me stuff. I, you're very nice to do that, by the way. Uh, somebody else sent in this. Beautiful drawing. And then somebody else sent in this letter. Snail mail. I'll, uh, I'll read it to you here. First of all, let me explain where it occurred because that this is Wyoming. This is Rollins, Wyoming, right here. This person was hunting in an area called Muddy Gap, right up here. So Rollins, Elk Mountain, Muddy Gap. If you've watched that movie, some of those areas are going to sound familiar to you. And here we go with the letter. Thanks for your channel. Enjoy it a lot, especially the factual news. I realize that the news is outside your normal expertise, but with an audience of your size, it is so important to get the information out that the government-controlled media will not, will not speak about. Thank you for doing that. If you haven't watched our factual news, please do do that segment once a week. I'm writing because I watched Missing 41 and the UFO Connection again. I'm telling you folks, people watched it anywhere between averages probably two and four times. In 93, I took a trip with three friends to Cal from California to Wyoming to deer hunt. The area we were hunting was directly north of Rollins on Highway 287 near Muddy Gap. I provided a map where I believe we were hunting. It was on top of a small mountain. On opening day, we all managed to bag an animal so that we might be celebrating around the campfire. It's probably about 8 or 9 p.m. as it was totally dark other than the campfire light. We were doing some drinking and just celebrating our success. One of the guys backed his truck up to the fire and turned on some Frank Zappa. We're all dancing around the fire and laughing about the lyrics and all of a sudden one of the guys pointed up to the sky and said, what is that? Now. If you watch the movie, you know that there are there's a hunter segment very similar to what these guys are talking about right here. We all looked up and approaching from the west at about 100 feet in the air, maybe a half a block away, was a black rectangular shaped aircraft, very, very similar to the one in your poster. The difference was that there were no lights on the bottom that I could see. I did have a row, it did have a row of red lights down the edge of each wing from nose to wingtip. It wasn't enormous, but it was large, definitely much larger than a fighter jet, maybe 100 feet from wingtip to wingtip. At some point, one of the guys said, listen, there's no noise, not a sound. I couldn't see any windows, only the red lights along the edge. 
it just drifted right over our campfire moving very slowly, maybe five miles an hour or so. As it passed our position, I could see the rear of the craft and there were two what I will call burners, like an F-18 Hornet. They were glowing red, but I couldn't see any fire or flame, no noise whatsoever. As it passed us, one of the burners shut down and went black, and then it just started to drift away out of sight. The weirdest part of the experience was that once it passed, it just went right back to what we were, we went right back to what we were doing like it never happened. The next day I waited for someone to mention the experience, but it never happened. We were in two separate pickups and on the way home with my traveling partner, I decided to bring it up. So I asked, hey, what'd you think of that thing that we saw the other night? My partner just said, oh, I forgot about that. I don't know. And that was the last we ever spoke of it. I've never talked to anyone about it until now. I always assumed that it was something from our military, but to this day I have never seen any mention that we had such a craft. At one point I studied stealth bumps, no, stealth blimps on the internet and thought that maybe that might be an explanation, but never saw a picture that matched. I just thought it was strange that we saw this craft very near where the men went missing on your latest video and that it matched the one on your 411 poster perfectly, other than the lights on the bottom. Thanks again for what you do. I'd like to turn, I'd like to turn on your channel and just let it run. It makes me feel like I have a friend in the house and I always love the discussion no matter the topic. Much love and my heartfelt condolences over your loss of your son. Thanks for that. You know what's the hardest thing about all this? Sometimes it just bugs the hell out of me. Is that I know if Ben was here, he'd be in the middle of this. He'd be right in the middle of doing all this research I'm doing. He'd be interested in it. He'd be engaged. Regarding the observation by this gentleman, in his group. Maybe it was the same thing and they just had the lights below turned off. I don't know. If the lights were turned off and you just saw the red perimeter of it, where's the picture? <laughs> Come on, you guys had to have the phone, your phones. But like so many times, People don't think about getting out their phone and taking a picture. It's almost that, like that part of your brain's turned off. Now, the part of your brain about the people that don't, don't want to talk about it, as I've stated before, I have a few friends that I've had forever, since grammar school. And one friend, he's a smart guy. He doesn't want anything to do with the UFO topic. He's polite. He was polite about my, my movie. He said it was a good movie. But he goes, that's not my thing. I'm not, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to talk about it. I, yeah, I don't believe it. Every rational part of his brain gets shut down on this topic. I think there's a lot of people in the world that certain things make them feel very uncomfortable, make them uneasy in the world. It's like the world goes unbalanced for a while. And if that is the case, then maybe just bringing up those topics, discussing them amongst a group, just ruins their day. So I don't bring it up. Somebody sent me this the other day. I liked it. It's called the Statement of the Day. As the island of my knowledge grows, so does the shoreline of my ignorance. John Archibald Wheeler. As the island of my knowledge grows, so the island gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the shoreline of my ignorance grows. 
the more you know, the less you really know. And the person who told me that, Ray Crow. When I bought his research in Hillsboro, Oregon, I never knew that I would be making this the track record. 174 newsletters, 3,000 pages, 1991 to 2007, he put out this newsletter. And we were sitting in his driveway. I had a big U-Haul truck and I was picking up all the research. I was driving it back to California. I was sitting in his driveway and he goes, Dave, I hope you have the epiphany that I didn't. I said, yeah, it's a real confusing topic. I'm, I'm kind of new to it, but I'm learning. And he goes, yeah. I think somebody told him, you know, the, the more you know, the less you really know. And you'll realize that. Yeah, I think that's right. So, as the island grows, yeah, so does the shoreline of ignorance. 100% true. And if people don't want to acknowledge that, then they themselves are pretty stupid. All right, first letter. Hey, Dave, I've watched all of your movies and I've watched every single one of your videos and I've pressed the like button on every single one of them. I live in Israel and I forgot how I found you, but I did. But I have pressed that like button for two reasons. Number one, it helps me track which videos of yours I've watched and which ones I have not. Number two, you deserve it. And why I'm bothering to write to you to ask. It's because I want you to know of yet another method that the powers to be are working behind the wings to manipulate your audience. So they're using Wikipedia to make people think you're probably a loon and are not worth their while. And they're bombarding your episodes with pop-up commercials as much as possible to frustrate the viewer. It doesn't work on me, but I'm not an adamant villager like someone who's visiting for the first time and such. By the way, the most commercials ever are on your factual news episodes. And now for the latest, hold your taters. Have you ever been unsubscribed? I have never been unsubscribed, but they've managed a new thing. I go on your video page and I go to the latest videos and I start watching from the last one that I stopped on. Sometimes, I don't know, I don't follow right when you post. It could take me a few days. And all of a sudden, while scrolling back to look for something on your videos, I noticed a video from three months ago that I haven't even seen. Now, that's an impossibility. I don't miss anything. I'm very thorough. And I always go to all the videos and see the last few I have yet to watch. And I start from the oldest one. Now, apparently, when you go on to your videos, there are three categories under which your videos are listed. Recent, most popular, and for me, I'm translating from Hebrew, so maybe you know it by a different caption. Now, up until recently, the default YouTube algorithm was set on recent. But now, I assume in order to deter me from noticing all of your video videos, the default has changed to, quote, for you, end of quotes. And then I only see what's for me. And there, it's mostly only the ones that I've already watched, and your newer ones are, who knows? I need to press on the current each time to see the newest ones. I hate them. But rest assured, you're not losing me as a villager. I'm here to stay. Thanks, Offer. Be to this place is weird. It's kind of strange. Angie and I have been in many parts of the world. And in every part of the world we go, we, we find friends that have been following me. When we were in Australia, we found a great couple that lived in the Blue Mountains. And they were our guides for two days, three days. It was awesome. When I go to a different state, there's always somebody there that knows me. Same in Canada. But I've never been to Israel. That's one of the one of the locations on my bucket list. I want to get there. There's so many important religious sites I need to visit. 
The other part of this is the destructive capabilities of YouTube. Uh, like I've said, I have had analysts that are experts on YouTube analytics, and they said, Dave, you should, you should by now have a million and a half people. It says you only have 400,000, and he said, I don't believe it. And many reasons for that. Obviously, the more people you have subscribing, the more people you have watching, and the more income you drive. That's the way YouTube works. If YouTube only says you have 400,000 people and you really have a million and a half, then maybe I should be making triple the amount of money that they're giving me. Number one. Number two, I've had thousands of people out there like you say, I've been unsubscribed. I've had thousands of people say that the amount of ads that they see on my channel are more than anywhere. And I've had other people on YouTube say the same thing about their channel. It's just being overwhelmed. Well, that's YouTube trying to make money off our channels. For me, I honestly believe it's a method to control the amount of time people watch. They want to push people away by all the ads. The more ads are, the harder to stay fluid in the conversation. And the more they break it up, the more people just leave and give up. I think that's the strategy. They'd rather get you to go into some other group that doesn't have my beliefs and thoughts. I get that. And again, I've told you before, I'd be willing to leave here in a minute if I can find a platform um, that fits that criteria I've talked about many times. And no, Rumble doesn't fit it. And there's, I have, one time in a month period of time, Angie and I were, was probably spent 70, 80 hours each going over different platforms. And the one that we need just doesn't exist right now. So I have to mind my P's and Q's and, and just be here. Yeah, I guess that's good for you because it's easily accessible. It's bad for me because I really can't say what I want, can't do what I want. Um, I was just told the other day that when I did the show for you where I emptied my backpack and I went through all the different items in there and I said, hey, I'm going to do another show and we'll talk about firearms. You know, I can't bring firearms and show them to you on the platform right here. I can't because if I do it'll get it on a, it'll be put on a restricted platform where my general audience won't see it <laughs> that's YouTube so can't do that uh, the other thing is I've had Hundreds of people say that they're watching one of my videos and they're trying to give me a thumbs up and they click on it, click on it, click on it, and it won't activate. Other people say, I'm 100% sure I clicked on the thumbs up and at the end of it, I looked at it and it, it looked like it hadn't been activated. I've had other people say that they were watching a video and there was no indicator that they could even give me a thumbs up. I've heard that hundreds of times. Again, trying to manipulate the response because if Let's just say I had a 99.9% .9 response on thumbs up. If people saw that, they'd say, wow, this guy's pretty good. Let's go watch. And they're trying to temper that. And my last couple of videos were down in the 98 percentiles. No idea why. So that's a little background. Also, if you ever see a response from someone on the comment section here that looks like me it, and it says hey go to this page and i'll talk to you there no don't do it in fact read carefully they have a logo that looks very similar to my can am missing logo but then the response up above it isn't me it's not the can am missing project and i will never ask you to go to another page i will never ask you to go somewhere else to talk or to do something i'll engage you right here under the comments some idiot is trying to, he, I'm not sure what he's trying to do, but it's no good, don't follow it, don't go. All right, so now back to the letters. Hey Dave, 
it's not any particular holiday or anything like that. As someone who enjoys the unknown and as someone who appreciates the exploration of all things mental health for survival and daily interpersonal environmental social martial arts, you are a source of inspiration and positivity. Check out the Cherokee stories about the moon-eyed people, a people who have stonework poetry, pottery, and tunnel systems indicating their past existence. They were known to be short, big-eyed, blue-eyed, and with very fair skin and platinum blonde hair. As sure as a child can get lost in a forest, a son can get lost in the struggles of several situations that are overwhelming. Wishing your soul and heart recovery so that you may be able to delight in times such as Christmas and New Year's. This is the worst. This is the worst. Christmas especially. I hope your son visits you in spirit time in Montana. Steve Irwin's father, Steve Irwin in Australia, crocodile man. His father, Bob, deeply mourned Steve when he passed. He has since felt Steve's spirit has visited him many times at most loved places in Australia. Let me say something. I can want, I can remember dozens and dozens of times my kids and I sitting on the couch watching Steve Irwin as he talked about animals specifically Crocs. The man had a gift. A real gift. You know, you're blessed in life if you find your passion and you can make a living from it. Steve Orwin did that. And he could relate that passion in such a way to the audience that it was so engaging. The guy was brilliant and he didn't even know it. And then he's swimming in tropical waters above a ray in the ocean. The ray felt threatened and it took its barb and flung it straight up right into his chest, into his heart, and killed him, almost instantly. They pulled him onto the boat. There was nothing they could do. I remember where I was when I heard that. Whew. Very few celebrities do I ever really want to meet. He would have been one. I would have liked to see him around animals. He never wanted to hurt one. He just wanted to educate. I don't think there's anybody, anybody better in the world around crocs and snakes than Steve Irwin. Of course, that isn't something that killed him either. He was around something that he really didn't know much. Every once in a while, I watch his son and daughter at their zoo. I do think about his dad, Bob. He's living in his own hell right now. It's too bad. feel sorry for him. He raised a great son, did a lot for the world. Next letter. Dave, I was living in Twin Falls, Idaho in the spring of 90. Our four children had been in bed for about 30 minutes. It was a school night. Our picture window faced directly south. My wife and I were watching TV. It was about 9.30 at night. 
All of a sudden, both my wife and I spotted, at the same time, looking out our picture window, a teardrop-shaped object that was traveling from left to right. It was an emerald green object. It was traveling at approximately 15 degree angle. We only seen it a few seconds, but long enough to notice two things. One was, there was no debris tell me, coming off it, no sparks, no smoke, nothing. Number two, both of us seen a distortion of waves behind it, like waves coming off a road on a hot day. I called our local radio station, Channel 11, KMVT. And I talked to our weatherman. He said, oh, you folks were lucky enough to see a meteorite with copper in it. The next evening, news people 90 miles away spotted a UFO near Sun Valley. And a MUFON investigator had been talking to several people there. They said they had seen a teardrop-shaped object going south to north. Time was about 9.45, same night we seen ours, and yes, it was emerald green. The investigator said, if anyone has information, to call them. We called it right then. He asked what we saw. We had seen it. They did. Plus, we seen it going from east to west and the distortion waves that startled him. He told us, well, we must have been close. He told them we could check KMTV and back up our time and said what we saw. Now, 2015 and June 16th, my grandson's birthday, he came down from Boise era area to celebrate with us. We helped him, we helped raise him for the first five years. His older cousin came over to spend the night. We had a fire going, and the four of us, it was a great night to be outside. We moved from Twin Falls to Hanson, Idaho, about eight miles east of US Highway 30. It was about 11.30 at night, the sky was crystal clear, being a population of about 900, not many lights on. Then as we were looking for satellites, something in, in outer space burst, like a star just blew up. Now, I know that didn't happen. Best comparison I can give was a very large motor or rocket or fireworks burst above us, only in outer space. It was huge. Plus one silly thing. As it was still in view, a single light brown thin line shot to the right. This all happened right over our heads. Kind of freaked out my grandkids and my wife. I thought it was cool. The next day, I called the planetarium at the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls. The curator also was the instructor that managed a large telescope there. I told them what I saw and what time it was, just in case he could check around to see if anything was there. He told us he had, he told us he had never seen one, only read about it, seen pictures also. He said he was jealous. He said what we saw was a meteorite coming straight at us and exploded. I have no idea what made a straight brown line. Whatever it was, it has to be very large and very fast. As the line went out further, than the burst. I reported this to MUFON online about a month later. Well, thanks for letting me use your and possibly your villagers as a sounding board. You try to tell others and they just give you that look. I hope you and yours are in good health. Try to laugh a little every day, it helps. Well, yes, it does help. Laughing is a, is a good thing. Step off screen for a moment. Sorry. My apologies for that. Next letter. Hey Dave, this was in Southeast Louisiana, April 2022. My mother and I were in the backyard enjoying a cool weather spring night. The planets and stars were visible as the sky was clear. Coming out of the Northeast, a three ringed object appeared so fast it didn't seem possible. It came to a complete stop and took off to the south. It crossed the entire horizon very quick. The whole, whole thing was over in probably three seconds. It left a streak in the sky like a bottle rocket. There was no sound left by this thing at all. It was a circle inside of a big circle inside of a bigger circle. It was seen with the naked eye. Whatever moves like that can't be humans and survive. It did not appear to be a physical object in my opinion seemed to be more like a light with the inability to move that fast or faster than light. The object glowed a bronze golden color. Many prayers are being sent to you and your family. It's pretty interesting. I've never seen or heard of anything like that. Next one. Hey Dave, I have no way of knowing if you'll actually read this email, but I am. You sent the only address I could find, so hopefully you will. I debated sending this, but 
have a gut feeling that it should. And something rather strange happened to me the other night. We live on five acres in the mountains about eight miles east of Kuskia, Idaho. I was watching YouTube and stumbled upon a Rick and Bubba video that you were on that talked about incidences in Idaho County in your 411 Idaho book. Since I live in Idaho County, it grabbed my attention. You had just been talking about the disappearances near Elk City when my phone rang. No one spoke when, I, when it answered, just silence. Caller ID showed United States government. Government, I presume. I was very curious as I live in that 926 area code. I called the number and the recorded message said that I had reached the Moose Creek Ranger Station, that it was close to it this time and that I could leave a message. A Google search revealed the station is remote and likely manned by only one person and then only seasonal. Since this location played a part in the stories as you related, the odds of this happening are beyond comprehension. All I can do is relay this happening onto you and see if it holds any meaning. I know exactly the ranger station you're talking about. Been there. That's when we went out to Idaho to do the background on the stories I went there. That is a bizarre set of coincidences. That's all I'll say. Hey Dave, one of your Missing 411 programs, you read a letter from a villager who men mentioned the film Time Trap. Normally, I would not comment or recommend a movie to you because I realize that you receive many recommendations over the course of a year, and there simply would be no way to watch or read everything, even if you wanted to. So true. At one, at one point in time, you had mentioned that if anyone made a recommendation to you, for that person to say, why? You should watch the program or read the book. Otherwise, the recommendation wouldn't even make it on your radar. 100% true. Don't say, oh, Dave, you ought to watch this. Why should I watch it? I have two recommendations to make to you as a fellow villager. One is the movie Time Trap, and the other is a radio program where a scientist who encounters a UFO is interviewed. This is the why, Time Trap. Occasionally, it is refreshing just to leave all of our cares and worries behind and become engulfed in a good movie or a good book. Maybe. Interview. In this interview, Willie Strieber talks, about, talks with a scientist with the name of Ed Belbruno. The interview is one of the most riveting accounts I've ever heard that occurs while driving through the Thunder Basin National Grassland in Wyoming, an area that was referenced in one of your recent 411 programs. I first listened to this program many years ago and have listened to it several times since. I've mapped out Dr. Del Bruno's exact route and plan to actually drive the same route at night at some point in time, just for the experience to see if anything happens. I might check it out though. for the note. Next. Instead of commenting on your UFO class number two video, I chose to email instead. Over the years, I've asked people if they saw anything in the night sky the week of immediately after 9-11. This was after all the aircraft had been grounded. So far, I've never heard from or spoken with anyone who saw anything similar as I described. Unfortunately, my memory of the sighting isn't as crisp since that was more than 20 years ago. After the attacks that occurred on 9-11, like so many other people, I was concerned about our nation and what was to come. After getting home from work, I'd usually watch the skies at night and go on long walks. One evening in particular, a day or two after 9-11, I was watching the night sky and saw something traveling at great speed. Question, did satellites back then possess any blinking lights? Not that I know about or have ever heard about. I piloted small planes in the past and worked around them, so I'm familiar with navigation lights. On a mostly clear night, whatever was traveling extremely fast had a red blinking light. Whatever it was was too high up and too fast to be a typical fixed-wing craft. It was only observed for one night. For years, I've scanned the night sky in multiple states and I've yet to see anything similar. This thing was incredibly fast. There was no sound. I'm still a little puzzled after all this time to see what it could be. It traveled a straight line, couldn't make out any sort of shape as it was too high and it was too late. The red blinking light made it possible to track in the sky, though the speed made it difficult. Does this sound like a possible satellite of that era, or could it be something entirely different? Nope, doesn't sound like a satellite. It's entirely different. Very rarely can you see satellites. It has to be just absolutely perfect conditions. 
No reason for a satellite to have a blinking light on it. All right. We're going to start with two cases. The first case is in a state that is rarely talked about here. But not because it doesn't come into play, it's just that I haven't spent much time there. In fact, I've only been there once. I watched ben, Ben's Miami, Ohio team play in the uh, Frozen Four in Delaware when he was at Miami, Ohio. But this case is from Delaware. And it's interesting. Man's name was Peter Warsham, 82 years old. Went missing July 23rd, 2007, just outside of Wyoming, Delaware. Now, Peter was a retired Delaware State Corrections Officer. That's him. He lived with family just across from Papen, P-A-P-E-N, Farms, a 1,500-acre farm, had lots of wildlife on it. Peter had walked it hundreds of times, and he liked to hunt it, and he had hunted it hundreds of times. Now, where is it located? And that's an interesting point. So, this is Papin Farms. This is Wyoming, Delaware. This is the Atlantic. This is Dover Air Force Base. Not very far at all from the farm and where Peter disappeared. I always am paying attention how far military bases are away from missing people. This is a new case, not in any book, never been talked about, important. So on July 23rd, 2007, at 3 p.m., Peter tells his family he's going to go across the street to the farm, do a little hunting, and he takes his cane and he takes his shotgun. And he walked across the street said he'd be back in an hour. That was 3 p.m. Four p.m. comes. Five p.m. comes. Six p.m. comes, they're getting nervous. So a couple of guys go back, start searching the farm. Seven, eight p.m. Now they start calling friends and everybody starts searching flashlights. They start putting out some bonfires. They're not finding anything. They search all night. The next day they call the Delaware State Police and Delaware Fish and Game. He was last seen wearing a bright orange hat. Something you can't miss. He's wearing a denim coat. Now, you know that and you know this because I've told you many times, the people that I have highlighted in my work oftentimes have disabilities, long-term illness, etc. Peter was one of those people that had a lot going on. He had prostate cancer seven years earlier or I'm sorry, six years earlier in 2001. He also had high blood pressure. And the family said that just recently he had had times where he was forgetful. And he took several medications. Peter was the type of guy that liked to go out and take long walks. And generally on those terms, he was healthy. He could he could walk a long way. Family also said he wouldn't get lost. He knew this area like you know your backyard because really that was his backyard. Papin Farms was the place that Peter went to get away from and just walk around and be at peace with nature. He was described as a very sweet and cordial man that everyone liked. 
Well, the police arrived on July 24th and immediately they called for the Maryland State Police Aviation Division because Delaware didn't have uh, police helicopters or planes. Maryland came over and did the work for them. And they flew over and they flew missions for four days over the property and over the adjacent properties. Then they brought in East Coast canines and they brought in Correctional Services canines. And then they brought in between 50 and 100 search and rescue volunteers each day for five days. They were getting frustrated. They were now double and triple searching areas that had already been searched multiple, multiple times. Towards the end of the five days, they switched up and they brought in cadaver dogs. Now, a cadaver dog can smell a dead body for miles. So if Peter was anywhere in that general area, within probably a seven or eight mile radius, the dog would pick it up. Wasn't picking up anything. Now they knew they had hard objects to look for. The cane, the shotgun, the hat should stick out. That bright orange hat. <laughs> Nothing was ever happened, never found. The family was devastated. A man that they'd seen every day go across, walk around, play in his kind of backyard at the farm. One day he's gone and that's it. How could that be? So this happened July 23rd, 2007. June 18th, 2009, almost two years later, the family asked for a civil hearing for the judge to render a verdict that he is deceased and that the family could take control and uh, over the over his possessions and make the payments etc in short peter was never found and that was now 16 years ago 17 years ago how could that be now those people walk the farm every day so you could pretty much say this didn't happen at the farm the farm also had one more thing on it. It had a large pond. And Delaware State divers searched the pond for three days, said so there was nothing in it. Nothing's ever floated to the surface, which the body would have, but it didn't. So let's go over some of the particulars. First of all, Peter was a hunter. He was a subgroup of missing people that seemed to go missing more than others. There was water in the area of this large pond. Canines were brought in, and in fact, cadaver dogs were later brought in. He had a disability, he had an illness. We named three different things that were wrong with Peter. And you had point of separation. After he left his family's house, said, hey, I'll be back in an hour. He never came back. Everybody stated he was in he was in a good mood, he was in good spirits. He didn't show any sadness, he wasn't depressed. Life was good. He was enjoying retirement from the Department of Corrections. Oddly, this is the first time I've ever worked a case where someone was from a Department of Corrections, State Department of Corrections. Strange. And there aren't many cases at all that I've ever worked in Delaware. Now, Delaware's a small little state, so. Okay, next case. National Park case. And you guys know that national parks, I'm deeply interested in them. Now, many of you know that a couple years ago, I applied to film in Yosemite National Park, and they refused to allow me to film there. 
Then there was a, a filmmaker that was cited for filming in a park without a permit. He was cited, went to court, and he brought a civil, uh, a civil rights attorney who won the case on the East Coast for saying it was a violation of his First Amendment rights by restricting his filming ability. And they had to toss out all the rules associated with requiring a permit to film in a national park. Now, I just heard within the last three or four months that the national park just won a reversal on that case. And now they're going to require a permit inside of all national parks, parks again. It's interesting. It is our parks, isn't it? If I go in there with a camera and a tripod and it's myself and one other person, how and why would they need a permit for me to do that? That would be like me and Angie going in and just filming for, for family issues. But now they're requiring a permit and they can refuse it, just like they did for me to go into Yosemite. Now, why did they refuse me for going into Yosemite? I sent an overnight packet that thick to them. I waited three weeks. They said they lost it and never got it. I sent it again. It was another six-week wait, and they denied it. And I've, I've read on here before what they said, and it was insulting. And they don't like what I'm saying about the national parks. But I'm not saying anything that's not truthful. In this story I'm going to tell you tonight, the National Park Police Officer did a great thing, he did a great job. And this isn't about the rank and file people, it's about the administration. This is about how they don't want you to have their information on these cases. And on a missing persons case with no evidence of criminal wrongdoing, why not release the case like every other jurisdiction does in the United States? I would say at least 90% of the jurisdictions release missing persons cases after 10 years. Nash, not the National Park Service. No, no, no. We can't do that. We can't do that. And then every once in a while, one of the national parks does. And it's, it's like they're not talking to other national parks and they just blanketly let them go. Now, this case, they didn't release it. But I did work my tail off to get all the facts on this, and I got them from a variety of sources. But in this incident, a man from Tennessee came to Rocky Mountain National Park outside of Denver. His name was James Pruitt, 70 years old. He went missing February 28th, 2019. The day he went missing is going to be in dispute on a couple of reasons, but I'll explain that to you. Now, James was in really good shape for being 70 years old. He uh, parked his car at the Glacier Gorge Trailhead. And this was the third visit he had made to this same park in three winters. He liked it. He traveled from E-T-O-W-A-H, E-T-O-W-A-H, Etowa, Tennessee. He had previously lived in Alabama, Massachusetts, and Tennessee. He had lots of family living around him in that Tennessee area. And he regularly called them when he was on trips. When he took off from Tennessee, he arrived in Estes Park. It's like the gateway to the park on February 22nd. So here's Estes Park, Colorado. He parked at the Glacier Gorge Trailhead right here. And this is a gateway into many different locations. Dream Lake, East Glacier Knob, Alberta Falls, Bear Lake Trailhead. It's a big area back in here with a lot of lakes and a lot of cool places to hike to. 
That he was parked here does not surprise me. Spent a lot of time in this park, a lot of great things to see, but in the winter months, it's a different kind of place. You've got to be careful for a multitude of reasons. First of all, the park has a lot of mountain lanes. Number two, gets a lot of snow. And with a lot of snow come a lot of avalanches. And I'm sure that's what these park officials were thinking at the time. Now, let me, let me slowly walk you through this. He arrived in Estes Park, and if you've never been to Glacier, Na I'm mean, sorry, Rocky Mountain National Park, Estes Park is a cool town. Uh, a lot of cool shops, a lot of good places to eat, park there, and then you drive into the park, and it's just a nice, it's a great place. I loved it. Every time I went there, I had fun. And you get there at the right time of the year, and elk are rocking through, right through the middle of town sometimes. Huge elk. It's quite a sight to behold. So, he called his family, family on February 28th at 10 a.m. in the morning. Just talked to him, called him all the time. Now, the Park Service did some background work and found a picture of him walking out of the Safeway in Estes Park at 9.48 a.m., also on February 28th. So it sounds like he came out of the Safeway, got into his car, and called his family. Now, the background work said that two feet of snow fell in the park on February 28th and March 3rd. And he parked his car at that Glacier Gorge lot trailhead. Elevation there's about 9,200 feet, lots of snow. He liked to hike, so it made sense. Now, rangers were doing patrol and found his car parked there for several days and it appeared to be abandoned. So they run the license plate through NCIC and they come back with a Tennessee license plate with a name and they have dispatch look up a phone number. Dispatch looks up the phone number and calls James family. It says, hey, we have this car parked here at this trailhead and it's now March 3rd. And we want to know if you've talked to James in the last day or two. Well, no, it's kind of strange because we haven't talked to him since February 28th. Hmm. And what did he say he was doing? Well, he said he was going to go hiking. Okay. Do you know where, where he was staying? Yeah, and he, they gave the name of the hotel. They sent police officers there. He wasn't there. So now they got, they got worried. So they call in search and rescue. Exact thing to do. But let's stop here for a second. It was the proactive, proactive work of the park police officer to find his car there under suspicious circumstances, be interested enough to run down the plate and find out what's going on. And they find out He's probably in the back country somewhere lost. Well, they call on search and rescue, and they actually went out and they found a picture on a game camera that they had up that James had hiked the Bear Lake area several times around the 24th of December, and that Dream Lake area as well and they just caught him on the camera walking by on the trail. Exactly what I'd be doing if I was on vacation or you'd be doing. But the Park Service has these game cameras up and you probably never will see them. Now it's against the law for you to put a game camera up inside the park. Yeah, it is against the law, but it's, it's okay if they do. So they start off uh, late February or March 3rd and the U.S. Weather Service had a weather advisory out at that time for extremely cold and dangerous conditions. It was blowing wind, and it was 10 degrees out. On blowing wind, it's 10 degrees. It's probably way below zero. And that is super dangerous weather to be out in. And I don't care what kind of suit you're in, moving around, getting around, blowing that hard, 
means the snow's going to drift up over the trail in spots. And there were comments in the search and rescue reports that they had four and five feet of snow that they were trying to get through. Well, March 7th through March 15th, there were 50 to 75 searchers per day with dogs. What they did is they took that search area and they broke it up into quadrants. And they put a certain number of searchers into each quadrant. And they wear a GPS device and it'll respond to search and rescue headquarters where all of these searchers walk. And you'll see these people walking in grids and things out there showing that the area has been covered. With cold blowing snow, it's dangerous. But they did it. And I could just already tell the mindset of search and rescue. I can already tell you what they're thinking. They first of all got almost a four day late head start on finding Mr. Pruitt. He had parked his car there at least on the 28th and they didn't get a start until late in the afternoon on the 3rd of March. So if he was injured, hurt, he's probably already buried by the snow that hit later that day on the 28th and on the 3rd. So they're thinking they could probably walk right by him on the trail and miss him, which would make sense. But then they also brought multiple, multiple canines out. But they weren't hitting on any scent either. So as you go back to your search and rescue meetings, they're saying, yeah, it's the conditions here are brutal. We just need to call it and we'll come back in the spring and we'll find him. Well, there were other searches in the spring after the snow melted. And it's been four years now with probably thousands of people up and down those trails. He hasn't been found. Now, when I did the background work on this, I found that it wasn't just one dog team. It was three other dog teams that helped participate in this. Larimer County Search Dogs, U.S. Search and Rescue Dogs. I don't know what happened here. Now, is it possible that Mr. Pruitt went up into the trail, had a medical condition, heart attack, and died? Well, of course it is. Where is he? You can't convince me that in February at the park, anyone is going to go far off trail in any of that area because the snow is so deep. Now, on the trail itself, it's pretty well stomped down. In some areas, it's so stomped down you don't need snowshoes. Other areas, you need snowshoes. I, I, you can't convince me that that man is going to go off that trail. So if he doesn't go off that trail, he means his body is going to be somewhere near that trail. And a cadaver dog walking that trail in the spring is going to find him. But it didn't happen. Why not? Well, that's a million, million dollar question. Now, since I started pushing the National Park Service, They've started to release these type of things. Now you notice, no name, <laughs> that's all it is. But that's Mr. Pruitt. Doesn't even say a location. Doesn't say anything other than a picture and a phone number. That's one of the worst jobs I've ever seen on putting out a wanted poster on a missing person. No date, no location, no squat. Now this should be on the trailhead where he disappeared so that something along the lines, if you've seen unusual bones or human remains, please call the park service. But you won't see that on any of the trailheads for the park service because they don't want to get people upset. They want you to have a good experience. Now, if you stumble over and you fall your face into a skull, well then tell us, but you won't hardly ever see a missing person poster on a trailhead or in an area where remains could be found, which I think is sick. 
I think the family wants them there, but the Park Service doesn't. More along the Park Service. Just recently, up here in northern Montana, our congressional rep is Congressman Zinke, who used to be the head of the Park Service. Now, Zinke has been pushing Glacier National Park really hard the last several weeks because his family tried to get a permit to go into a park one of several days. Couldn't get a permit. You see, you have to call in right at 8 o'clock and they release several hundred permits. But he couldn't get a permit. And I guarantee he's had a lot of complaints from people like me and families like mine who can't get a permit to go into the park 15 miles away. We can't get in. There's so many people from all over the world, even the neighbors that support the park, can't get in. Well, on Twitter the other day, he put up a post about this and I responded. And what I said is that Angie and I had some friends in from out of town last summer. And we got a special location permit. Angie woke up like at six in the morning one morning and kept calling and calling. Finally got in and got the permit to go on the back side of the park, St. Mary's. And it's to go in that special gate on a special day. Okay. So we load our friends in who are up from Colorado and we spend two hours driving around to the other side of the park and we get up to the gate, Ranger's there, we present our permit and said, says, no, sorry, sorry, uh, we're full, full. I got a permit. And he says, or she says, nope, you're not getting in. Just like that. I said, but I have a permit, which is supposed to allow me to get in. Sorry, too many people can't go in. Then why did you make me get a permit? Sorry, sir, I'm not here to argue with you. You can't get in. Okay. So I turned around, we left. Needless to say, old Dave was a little steamed. Not only did we not get in, we never got a refund for our money. And I don't mind saying that it sounds, and it felt like a scam. Because what good is the permit if you can't go in? Right. So don't think that if you have a permit to get into a park, you're going to get in. Because I'm the first one to tell you, it ain't happening. Which is why our Congressman Zinke is upset at the Park Service. I don't, I don't have a good explanation other than they need to manage their system better and only sell enough permits to allow into that gate at any one day. Why would you oversell? That's idiotic. You're just going to get the public upset. You get my point. I understand why there's a big push to see Glacier. In my humble opinion, I think Glacier is the most beautiful park in the system. So, But anyhow, that's my rant on the National Park Service. Frontline people are the best. Don't get mad at them ever. It's the administrators that suck. So, be nice to people. Please be nice to people. Give the video a thumbs up. Spread it around your social media. And I have a lot of videos on here. Please watch them. Like a lot of people say, Dave, I have them on in the background. I just listen to you all day. Just do that. That would help us a lot. But in the meantime, love your family. Do something good for someone in your neighborhood, someone in your community. Volunteer your time. Politis out. <laughs>